In the 1930s, a remote farmhouse in Cashin's Gap on the Isle of Man became the focus of weird events. Following a poltergeist outbreak, a small strange creature appeared. The Irving family, who owned the house, heard the animal speak. It claimed to be a mongoose called Jeff, who had been born in India in 1852. Jeff haunted the family for almost a decade and became world famous. He was even mentioned in the British Parliament. Although the house at Cashin's Gap was demolished in 1971, Jeff remains a Fortean icon to this day. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's me, uh, Barry Tadcaster, back again. And uh, this is my old mate, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. I'm an Earth Wonder at World, me. Thou shalt never know what I am. I already know what you are, you're a talking mongoose. Oh, that's by the by, that's by the by. I was born in New Delhi in 1852. Hey! Well, you've aged quite well, ain't you, mate? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's rolled around again. It's time for another episode of On The Track Extra with me, Barry Tadcaster, and Jeff the Talking Mongoose. You know, you know, uh, 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 Jim tells me stuff. Mam feeds me and I follow Vori. So, Jeff, what are we going to do this week then? This week, this week, we're going to be visiting a malodorous shanty! Hello, Charlotte. Yeah? Why are you looking out the window, looking with a very vacant I'm look on your face? <laughs> you really had a very funny look on your face then. Okay. So, happy birthday for yesterday. Thank you. How did it feel to be an adult? Not much different from before, to be honest. It doesn't, does it? I remember my 18th birthday, I felt absolutely nothing different to when I was 17 the day before. Yeah. In fact, I think everybody I've spoken to, whenever they've gone through these big life-changing uh, milestones, they never actually make you feel any different. Mm. It's like getting married the moment I walked out of the church holding Karina's hand. You're supposed to feel, goodness me, I'm completely different. But it doesn't. It just creeps up on you over the next few days. Mm. Anyway, my darling, tell me something interesting. The largest mushroom ever was about eight, had an area of 880 hectares in Oregon. A single mushroom? A single mushroom. That is ridiculous. So you got a picture? Fungi are very strange things, and I would hazard a guess that quite a lot of what you think you know about them is absolutely wrong. For one thing, they're not plants. In fact, in many ways, they're more similar to animals. Similar to animals, fungi are heterotrophs. They acquire their food by absorbing dissolved molecules, typically by secreting digestive enzymes into their environment. And, unlike plants, fungi do not photosynthesize. But let's talk specifically about mushrooms. In fact, one particular mushroom. The visible bit of a mushroom like this is far from being the complete organism. Armillaria is a genus of parasitic fungi that include the Amelaea species known as honey fungi that live on trees and woody shrubs. 
Amelaris are long-lived and form some of the largest living organisms in the world. The largest known organism of the species Amelaria ostoiae covers more than 3.4 square miles, that's 8.8 .8 kilometers squared, in Oregon's Malheur National Forest and is more than 2,400 years old. However, despite claims to the contrary, it's by no means the oldest living organism. A huge colony of the seagrass, Posidonia oceanica, in the Mediterranean Sea near Ibiza is estimated to be between 12,000 and 200,000 years old. There is a colonial colony of Populus tremoroides, the quaking aspen trees, in south central Utah, United States, has been estimated at 80,000 years old, and the sole surviving colonial colony of a shrub called Lamartia tasmanica in Tasmania is estimated to be at least 43,600 years old. Mycelium is the vegetative part of the fungus or fungus-like bacterial colony consisting of a mass of branching thread-like hyphae, which are sometimes called shiro, especially within fairy ring fungi. Fungal colonies composed of mycelium are found in and on soil and many other substrates. A mycelium may be minute, forming a colony that is too small to see, or may grow to span thousands of acres, as in Armillaria. At various times and on the track, I've mentioned my old friend Ken Campbell, Fortean, playwright, actor and so much more. His daughter, Daisy Aris Campbell, is an equally remarkable writer and performer who in 2013 started a production company called Mycelium to create magical theatre and interactive experiences aiming to the stand in the tradition of her legendary and sadly late father. They are a female-led production company spanning decades of alternative and DIY culture. They hold the torch for and have reignited an aspect of the counterculture ecology, and they are in search of the others, anyone who gets what they do and is up for a mind-expanding caper. They name themselves the Mycelium because it expresses their belief that growing connections between underground creatives helps to build a new culture. But, as I so often do, I'm digressing, which is something I'm very good at doing. But now I think we need to get back to the main narrative. Well, all sorts of things have happened in the meantime. And by the time I got back to Charlotte, it was coming towards the second half of the afternoon. And although I was ready to talk to her, she was outside painting, but she was kind enough to grant me a few moments of her time. But that wasn't all that had changed. I'd originally wanted to talk to her about the latest evidence that the large tortoiseshell butterfly still exists in England, despite the fact it was declared extinct sometime in the 1950s. But in the intervening hours, something else had happened. Something quite extraordinary. Shall it guess what? I have some really amazing news for you. What is it? Well, you'll remember that many, many years ago, I wrote a paper about pine martins in England. And the Mammal Society and the people at the British Museum of Natural History told me I was an idiot. And in the last ten yeah, years, pine that. martins have started turning up all across parts of England. And one has just turned up in Suffolk. Yeah for something like the first time in a century and a bit. Where is Suffolk? <laughs> it's like east, isn't it? Suffolk's east, yeah. Back in 1977, two academics, Langley and Yalden, wrote a paper on the decline of the rarer British carnivores. In it, they charted the decline of three rarer British carnivore species, the wildcat, the polecat and the pine martin. Over the years, my researches led me to the conclusion that the pine martin in particular was still alive in various parts of the United Kingdom where it supposedly had been extirpated over a century before. 
an old friend and colleague of the CFZ, actually took my results to one of the authors of the aforementioned paper, and I'm not going to mention anybody's names because I don't really want to cause any more nastiness, but the person involved wasn't the slightest bit of interested. My results, he said, didn't conflict with his at all. Well, for the last ten years, pine martins have been turning up all over England in places where they hadn't been seen for decades and decades and decades. And the latest of these sightings is a dead specimen found on a beach at Felixstowe in Suffolk. If you look at Langley and Yalden's results, they believe that the species became extinct in Suffolk in the middle of the 19th century. But whilst this is undeniably exciting news, I would warn against people getting too excited too quickly. First of all, there were some peculiar aspects to the one that turned up in Devonshire last year. It was apparently microchipped and the body was taken away, but the person who found the body microchipped it and contacted the relevant authorities, sadly couldn't remember who these relevant authorities were, although he did tell us that the body had been retrieved by them. There was something particularly fishy about that episode. Also, I would like to point out that Felix, though, is a busy, bustling international port and it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that a pine martin from somewhere on mainland Europe had hitched a ride unwittingly upon one of the ships which come into Felixstowe on a regular basis. And finally, Felixstowe Beach was the site of another cryptozoological hoax. It was claimed, and lots of people, including us, actually believed it for a short time, that a small family of penguins had come up hitching a ride upon an unwitting cargo ship. This was actually a hoax, and rather a funny one, but it does prove that Felixstowe Beach is not exactly immune from such things. So, whilst it's very exciting, the possibility that there are now pine martins in Suffolk, and probably always have been, I would just remind you what Oscar Wilde said, that the truth is seldom pure and never simple. Or was it the other way round? Hey Charlotte! Charlotte, you're never going to guess who's just arrived! Is it one of the comedy rhinoceros? No, I'm afraid not. Not quite as exciting as that. It's Karina. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Karina's back out of hospital and it's lovely to have her home. However, she really isn't very well at all. And on top of that, she's lost her voice as a result of one of the surgical procedures she's been through. So I'm afraid she isn't going to be being part of On the Track for a while at least. But she's here in spirit and it's lovely to have her home again. On top of that, I've been in the wars as well, and I managed to injure my foot quite severely. And so for the last couple of months, I've been having regular visits from the district nurse, all gowned up and masked up because of the lockdown, because of COVID-19. And I've been given an interesting but quite debilitating cocktail of hard painkillers. So that's one of the reasons that the main reason why there haven't been anywhere near as many on the tracks as one would have hoped over the last few weeks. And because I'm on a large amount of tramadol at the moment, it's the reason I may or may not sound completely tripping out of my gourd. So Charlotte, while we're talking about my foot, yeah. do you think I ought to show all the boys and girls out there in viewer land a picture just to tell you what I mean so if you can see what I mean I don't see why not 
I can think of very reasons why not. It's pretty revolting. So, ladies and gentlemen, here is a picture of my foot to show why I am on Tramadol and why, at the moment, I am speeding through space like an out-of-control Earth star something or other. But because I would not want to alarm people too much, this is a trigger warning. It's fairly nasty. So if you don't like nasty stuff, turn away. Do 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 All that black stuff is actually necrotic or dead tissue. And I've had to have all of that and more cut off over the last few weeks. And it's not been very pleasant. But I hope all you out in viewer land will accept my excuses for why we've not been as prolific as I wanted to be over the past few months and will accept my apologies and my sincere hope that we will get back to some sort of normal service sooner rather than later. But now I think it's time to go back to some sort of cryptozoology content. A few years ago, there was a piece of footage which did the rounds, which was allegedly taken on a camera mounted on the helmet of a motorcycle rider somewhere in Sumatra, and it showed, or appears to show, a short, naked man running along a road with, I think, elephant grass on each side and brandishing a spear and then disappearing off into the elephant grass. What do you think about it? A rancor deal? It could be an rancor deal. My first thought, though, is that it's probably uh, a modern human from a, a very short tribe. There are these tribes of people. We know about the pygmies in the Congo, but there are people from the Philippines that are very short as well. Um, it's not impossible that, that, that there is... Uh, the Vedas? Um, they're, they're in India okay. and, and Sri Lanka, but yeah, there's these people from the Philippines. But it's not impossible that there, there are races of, of short, jungle-dwelling people in Sumatra that are fully modern human beings, but they're very small. The Arankar Dill is something that's separate from the Arankpendek. Um, the people say that it's about three feet tall, which is smaller than the Arankpendek. Uh, it's more human looking, they go naked in the jungle, usually, uh, they, they don't have hairy bodies but they have long hair on that, their head, and they hunt with bamboo spears that have spo poison tips, uh, which sounds almost identical to the Ibu Gogo of um, Flores. Mm. And my guide in Sumatra for the first um, four expeditions, uh, the late Sahar Dimas, his father, around 1980, had uh, an encounter with these things. Um, at the time, he was trading. Uh, uh, he was with a friend, and they were exchanging rice for other goods. And they were in a remote area of what is now Kerinci Sablak National Park. And they'd gone along a ridge, and they'd made camp for the night. And they'd come down the other side, and they were cooking some rice. and. The story goes that one of these creatures, the Orang Cardil, walked into the camp and started stealing the rice. And Sahar's father's friend killed it with a parang, which is similar to a machete. Then more of these creatures came out of the undergrowth, armed with bamboo spears, and killed this guy. But they left Sahar's father alone because he hadn't attacked them. But reports of them seem to have just fallen off. Um, when I go go to Sumatra, uh, I always find lots of people that have seen the Orang Pendek. When I ask about the Orang Cardil, they say they've heard of it, but they've never seen it. Do so you think they could? Do you think the Orang Cardil could be a, a mythological interpretation of the Orang Pendek? No, because they're so very different. The Orang Pendek is bigger, bulkier, hairier. Its tool use is, you know, throwing rocks and and sticks and things. It doesn't use spears, it doesn't go in groups. They're two very different things. Yeah. And I think it could be 
um, a relative of uh, Homo floresiensis. That's very reasonable theory. Because we've got we've got the new relative of floresiensis now in the Philippines. There are two hominid skeletons from hominin rather skeletons from Red Deer Cave in mainland China that were only about ten thousand years old that would also be interpreted as belonging to this same lineage which is from the um, Homo habilis rather than Homo erectus so it's looking like Homo habilis had its own quite separate um, lineage outside of Africa and these, these two haven't even been given names yet okay. Carl, when you were in Borneo you were asking about the Batatut? I was, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, anybody I could find I would ask about the Batatut and just see what people thought about it the first thing was that most people were not familiar with the name at all. Um, in fact, I had to refer to it as a rang pendek for them to fully understand what I was talking about. Oh. Um, the, the main theory that I was told was that they were uh, people that had been shunned away from villages through to deformities oh. and were living wild in the jungle. Oh. Do you think there's any credibility to that at all? Uh, possibly, but I think they'll find it hard to live in the jungle on their own. Mm. Uh, so that might be an interpretation by the people of something that they don't understand. If they're seeing some sort of unknown hair-covered primate, they might think that that was a, a cast-out mm. human being. I thought it was interesting, though, that they did, they weren't familiar with the name Batitude at all. Mm. And I had to call it a Rang Pendek for them to know, which means that they're obviously aware of modern stories of a Rang Pendek. Yeah. So, yeah. But the tradition of a creature like that on, on Borneo isn't nowhere near as, as powerful as it is on Sumatra. Absolutely not, no. Yeah, I can vouch for that. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's me again. Over the last few months you've probably noticed that On The Track has changed. Well, there's a very good reason for that. The thing is that between 2000 and 2017, that's 17 years for those of you who can't count, I was the main promoter of an annual event called The Weird Weekend. And it was a conference aimed at about and for people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology. And although it wasn't all about cryptozoology, it was all full of events and lectures and film shows and ex exhibitions on subjects which I thought that people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology would be interested in. And it was all wrapped up in a nice overcoat of surreal fun. And you know what? I miss it terribly, which is why about six months ago I decided that I was going to rebrand on the track. I thought we'd do a monthly episode of about half an hour, and then in between each episode we do what I call on the track extra, which resurrects somewhat of the feel of the old weird weekend. And have a look at these two examples, which I chose almost at random because I thought that you might enjoy them.